I thought I'd be done designing for a while, but before I get into the machining, there was one thing that I decided to change. There is a set range of tolerance that determines the size screws can be. The location of the threaded holes the screws go into also has a tolerance range. So when bolting two parts together and one of them has a through hole, the hole needs to be large enough to account for the range of the screw diameter and the positional inaccuracy. But on my handles, I want to make sure they're all aligned nice and flush. But I realized something I didn't notice the first time I took apart my butterfly knife. It actually has these threaded tubes in the rear section of the handle. I was already going to use these for the stop pins at the top of the handle, but I also could use them like they did in the spacer section of the handle. I was thinking about using a pin or a boss or something to keep the parts all aligned and flush. But if I just use the same tubes, it'll line everything up like dowel pins. Plus, now there's one less part I have to tap. I decided to start by making the pins first. I don't have a CNC lathe, so I made some drawings and printed them out. I got some key stock on McMaster. I'm starting with brass, but I also got some stainless. But brass is easier to machine, so that's what I'm going to do prototypes with first. It has decent tolerances, and it's already square, which means I can do the round parts of the pin in the lathe, but I don't have to do the square parts in the mill. They're already done. I also had to get a square collet though. I started by drilling through the full length of the pin. Conveniently, I was able to use the same grooving tool to turn the part, face the part, groove the part, and part off the part, instead of having to use different turning tools. After parting off a few of them, I could put them back in the machine and tap threads into the ends of them. There's one problem though. These pins attach to the buttons, and the buttons need to have some play in them for the scissors to be able to work. This means that I had to count the turns of the tap in order to not tap too deep. That way the screw bottoms out. Next time, I think I won't drill all the way through, and instead we'll just drill a little on both sides. If I want to do it that way though, I probably should buy bottoming taps. Taps usually have a few tapered threads to help them get started, but this means that a screw wouldn't be able to go to the bottom of a hole. After tapping the hole, if you then switch to a bottoming tap, you could then get those last few threads. I wouldn't have to worry about tap depth at all if I had screws with a shoulder. I looked up shoulder screws on McMaster, and I would have got them, but they're crazy expensive, so maybe I'll just make them myself in the future or something. Seems like most knives don't even bother with any of this. They just screw everything together in a sandwich and then hope that you don't over tighten it or that you'll check on it if it becomes loose. I decided to try machining the blades using the super glue method. I've never done it before, but I usually don't make parts this thin and flat. I thought that it would be a good thing to try because then I don't have to make a fixture or soft jaws or anything to get a finished part. Eventually I'll make the blades out of stainless steel, but to get a prototype done faster, I started with aluminum. The larger the surface area of glue you have, the better chance the part will stay stuck while it's being machined. This is why I machined the internal pockets of the part before moving on to the outside. I then ramp down the outside contour of the part, which means that I have a full rectangular piece of stock until the very end of the cut. Hopefully by ramping I'm also putting a downward pressure on the part. I'm taking light cuts so that I don't risk pulling the part up with the flutes of the end mill. But if you take too light of cut, potentially you might heat up the part, which can also cause the glue to fail. I do a couple of light finishing passes with a 3.30 seconds end mill, but then the part can be peeled off. To make the square holes, I wanted to try using a brooch. A brooch works by pushing a escalating series of teeth that start out round, but then become square or whatever other shape. 
unfortunately, I don't really have a great setup for broaching. And so I ended up bending the part and then I bent it back. And at that point, I guess it had work hardened because the part ended up snapping. Another problem with broaching is how do you make sure the brooch is clocked to the correct angle? A lot of applications, the brooch can be at any angle you want, but for me, I need the diamonds to point straight up. So I would have to make some kind of jig to hold the brooch exactly at the right angle. Because I tried to get a brooch that was uh, easy to acquire and affordable, I didn't notice that I accidentally got a brooch that had a larger pilot hole diameter than the square it creates. Apparently this is more common than a true square brooch, because usually I guess people just need the corners. Another option I could have looked into was rotary broaching. Tormach actually sells a rotary brooch, and rotary broaching is even cooler than regular broaching. It's basically magic, I'm pretty sure. But at least with the Tormach one, I have a similar problem. It pretty much just spins and gets caught on the metal, meaning that how the shape is angled is pretty much random. Maybe there's a way around this, but I decided to cut my losses and just do the mouse ear method to relieve the corners. The button will cover up the squares anyway, so I don't know why I cared about them being perfect squares. I'll find a better excuse to use a brooch in the future. I decided to try doing the super glue technique for the button as well. It's a lot smaller and it has surfacing that needs to be done, which means that there's more side loads on the button which will cause the glue to unstick. And that's exactly what happened. And so my solution was I just cut out a bigger piece of metal. I was actually able to get multiple from the same piece. It turns out I didn't really need that much more area for it to stay stuck. Doing it this way also meant I had to fuss around with the tape and the glue less often. Because I'm now using those threaded tubes, I actually can forgo the handle spacers for the prototype. So that means the last part is to just make the handles. I decided not to do the super glue method because this part's taller and there's a step that needs to be machined. So I thought there might be more leverage that would cause the part to become unstuck. I then modeled a fixture that had a cutout for the handle. It also had space for two hexagon clamps I had already got from a different project. They work by having a head that's off center so it creates a cam action that pushes the hexagon into the part, clamping it. They're not super strong, but they're also less likely to mar the part than other methods. I machined away the material and then tried fitting in the first operation handle into the fixture and then run a few extra passes because it was too tight. All that happens in the second operation is facing off the extra thickness that was used to hold it in the vise in the first op and counterboring the holes so that the threaded tubes can be positioned accurately. And skipping right to it finished and assembled, I think it's pretty great. And it does work better than the plastic, although since I've now played with it a bunch, the aluminum and brass are wearing into each other more than they should, and it's getting a little bit sloppier, uh, but that's expected. And it will cut paper just like the last one, even though it's not sharp or anything. There's still lots of things I need to do, like make the button click up and down, but I think it turned out pretty cool, and I think it's only going to end up being even cooler in the future.